Awesome. Thank you so much for that. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter number 17 this morning, but uh, let me say just a word about um, the Thanksgiving fellowship. Of course, um, there's been more people tested positive <laughs> for uh, COVID here lately, and so we want to be extra cautious. Now, I will, I will fight and go to jail for worship service, um, but... Um, Thanksgiving dinner is a little bit extra, and uh, I don't want to go to jail for Thanksgiving dinner, <laughs> but <laughs> we will have over 10, okay, people at, uh, at Thanksgiving dinner on Thursday, I will say that, so if you want to come get me, uh, those who are watching live stream, but, uh, but I, I don't want to get our church in any, any uh, trouble or any legal problems, and um, so this is an interesting time. Let me show you two scripture verses real quick before we get into the message. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 15. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 15. I think this explains a lot of what's going on uh, in, in today's culture, in today's society. A lot of leverage um, and you know, a lot of freedoms being waived uh, because of this particular thing. Here in Hebrews chapter number 2, verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Uh, and if you are afraid and give over your freedom uh, to the government, um, you know, most likely you're not going to get those freedoms back. It's kind of like the um, interstate, you know, the, um, the freeway. Once they get that paid off, you know, that's going to be free. Do you know that? Um, <laughs> I've been telling us that since the 50s. And, uh, you know, one of our father, forefathers said uh, that, you know, he gives up liberty for freedom or liberty for um, safety. Safety. We'll have neither liberty nor safety, right? I want to show you another verse. Look at Job. Job chapter number two.
here is uh, here is Satan. So he's been studying the same model for thousands of years, right? Um, and so there's a few things that do not change. God does not change. Mankind, fallen mankind, does not uh, change and is of his nature. And then also, uh, Satan has not changed since the time of Job. And Job. Um, Satan knows the model of mankind, but he says in verse number 4, Job 2, 4, here's Satan speaking. Uh, and Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath he will give for his life. Um, and so if you, if you threaten a man's health or a woman's health or safety, you can, if they buy into that, they will be led into bondage. And here Job says, Every, you know, all men will give up everything they have, accusing, they'll, they'll, in fact, they'll also forsake you, Lord. Uh, they'll forsake you, God, uh, if you threaten their health. That's what Satan said. I didn't say that. Uh, and that's what Satan said. And, and so you see different elements. Uh, you see the most godless states um, in America are the ones who are taking the most liberties away. I have a friend, uh, Steve Swanky. He, he had COVID. I've known a lot of people who have have come down with COVID. I've known some people have been very, very sick. But that's few in number. People whose health is compromised anyway. Uh, and then I've known uh, many, many people who've had it and got over it. And it was like a, a cold or a mild flu. Uh, but yeah, my friend Steve Swanky, who he, you'll meet him in March, but he pastors down in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, and he said, man, I, I, I've got COVID. I've come down with it. And um, I said, what are you going to go virtual for a couple of weeks? He said, oh, no, man. He said, 50% uh, of our churches had it. I mean, my assistants had it. My song leaders had it. Um, most of my members have had it. I said, you're lucky that you don't live in the state of New York or Cuomo would be talking about you <laughs> uh, in particular. In the health department, I've known churches in the, in the state of New York that the health department has shut them down. Like they can't even go into their church during the week. No particular church in Elmira, New York, that they have to drive down uh, to Pennsylvania just to meet together uh, because they, and, and I, you know, I, I've heard their story, their side of the story. They've followed their due order, uh, but the government has persecuted them. It's all up to these little uh, department, these different health departments and these little uh, dictates. So, um, you know, just having said that, we do want to be cautious and be careful not to have something extra outside of our regular church services that uh, would make us a target. Uh, and so that's why we're going to keep the turkeys in the freezer, okay? We will eat those turkeys and those hams at some point here in the near future. Um, so that's why we made that call, and I was looking forward to it for months, the big oh, Thanksgiving you. dinner. <laughs> but uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to do it some at some later date. Uh, Luke chapter number 17, we're going to look at verses 1 through 10, and I think this is going to be an edification and a blessing to all of us. It's going to be a challenge to us this morning. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he, in the latter part of his ministry, just speaks to two different groups of people. He's typically either speaking to the Pharisees, which he has been doing uh, in chapters number 15 and 16, uh, and in chapter number 17, he's going to speak to his disciples. Uh, and the disciples are the adherent uh, to uh, the doctrine of the Lord Jesus. And so they're not only just hearers, but they're also doers of the Word of God. And he's going to challenge them. Uh, he's going to tell them to take heed unto themselves. So uh, he's going to talk to them about the matter of forgiveness here in verses 1 through verse number 10. So if you find your place there in Luke 17, we will stand for the reading of God's Word in verse number 1. It says there... <clears throat> Luke 17, 1. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. 
But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise, ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, saying, We are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. And uh, let's pray and we'll be seated together. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, we thank you that you are our hiding place, that you are our shelter. We thank you just for uh, the time that we have together. To seek your face this morning, Lord, I pray that you would just, just once again be merciful to us. Lord, I pray that you would bless this place and hold it in the palm of your hand. I pray that each and every man, woman, and child uh, that is here today would receive a blessing from the Word of God. I pray for those who are watching on live stream. I pray that you'd bless them, bless their families, bless their lives. Lord, I pray that your Word would feed us. I pray that we would hear your Word. I pray that we would take the challenge. And the command that's given to us regarding the matter of forgiveness, pray that we would apply it and that we would just enjoy uh, just great liberty and freedom in the Christian life by the Holy Spirit uh, because we've taken heed to the things which you say in your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen and amen. You may be seated. Someone said this, uh, salvation is the miracle of a moment, but discipleship is the process of a lifetime. <laughs> and so when you were born again in the family of God, what happened is that you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You called upon Him for salvation. You realized that you were a hell-bound sinner, that if you got what you rightly deserved, that you would just you'd split hell right open. But God, in His great love, Wherewith he loved you, he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for you on the cross. And the Lord Jesus was the greatest gift ever given. And you received the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. You believed on him as your, as your Savior and for the salvation of your soul. Then a supernatural miracle took place. You were born again into the family of God. You were taken out of Satan's family. Uh, you walked according to the course of this world, the children which uh, walk underneath the, the, uh, the, the hard taskmaster of Satan. You were taken away from Satan, and you were placed into the family of God. You were adopted into the family of God. Uh, and so you were, starting then, a child of the faith. You were uh, a newborn babe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that point on, you are in the family of faith and you are also in the school of faith. And so you started in the faith and you are to continue into the faith to the, to the time the Lord Jesus Christ takes you into heaven. And so every single year that we live here upon this earth, that there is to be a growth spiritually between us and the Savior. And it is a constant process. And uh, we are all in school this morning in different, in different uh, grade levels of that school. And we're going from one grade to the next grade to the next grade. And it talks about the believers uh, that they shine brighter and brighter until that perfect day. And that we are supposed to emulate Christ more and more as we tra tra um, travel with Him. Uh, and so the Lord says to His disciples in verse number 1, it says, then he said unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses come, but woe unto him through whom they come. For it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Then he says, Take heed to yourselves. Many, many times in scriptures we're given this command that we are to in, be introspective of our own life. We are to examine our own hearts and examine our own lives. Uh, one of my old preachers say all the time, he says, draw a circle around yourself 
and make sure that you correct everything inside of that circle. It's very easy for me to find your faults this morning. And it's very easy for you to find mine because uh, our faults are many. But what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to look at myself and examine my own life. And so he says, If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he re repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So tell him my message this morning is exercising forgiveness. Uh, and there's repetitions here involved in exercising forgiveness. And notice that if your brother sins against you seven times in a day, how many times are you supposed to forgive him in a day? Seven, seven times. Uh, and so there is a repeated action here in the matter of forgiveness. Uh, there's many things in life that we have to do again over and over and over and over again. I was talking to my friend and pastor over there at um, Calvary Baptist Church, Hector Sotomayor, just retired from the police force and among other things he did for them, he was an instructor, a shooting instructor. Um, it's one thing shooting a long gun, I get my rifle out once a year, just make sure that thing is right on line and, and I'm hunting with a Ruger 270 and got a Leopold LX scope right on top of that gun and every single year, man, you got good equipment, it lasts forever and it just stays on point, stays on target. Every time I get that gun out, it just like shoots bullseye at 100 yards. I'm like, yep, still on target, I can put it away. I don't even have to practice shooting it again. I mean, it's a pretty simple concept is you just put the crosshairs on something brown and you pull that trigger uh, and you put it right in the right spot, it is going down. Uh, however, you take a little short little pistol, there's something, it's amazing with the, those little guns, how far off, it's just hard just to hit the target a lot of times and you could swear that you're putting the crosshairs right on that target. Uh, and I was talking to Hector, he says, yeah, there, there is a diminishing it, it's shooting a pistol is a diminishing skill, meaning that you have to practice repetitions over and over again. And so the police officers continually have to go into the shooting range and shoot their pistols, and they shoot it from different locations. And I said it's always amazing when you hear a story. Uh, you watch, you know, you watch a shootout between uh, bad guys and police officers, and they tell you how many uh, bullets were discharged, and it's like 250 bullets were discharged, and the perpetrator was hit once in the ankle. <laughs> or something like this. You know, 200, 250 rounds were shot at this guy and uh, some, somebody by luck hit him. Uh, and he said the reason why is he said there's stories of a policeman and uh, a guy on an elevator and I can't remember how many rounds were discharged. It was something like uh, 18 rounds were discharged on an elevator between a perp and a, you know, and a police officer on an elevator and neither one hit each other. And he says so there's got to be that continual practice because it is a diminishing skill. Next time you watch a drug commercial on television, uh, listen to when the guy's talking about 100 miles an hour, yeah. right at the end. Uh, besides the you know sudden death and thoughts of suicide and this, um, it, it'll say something. It'll say something along this nature. Uh, it'll say. This pill has been known to reduce uh, whatever it is, uh, you know, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood, lower blood sugar with diet and exercise. And I always think, you know, what if, um, what if you just did the diet and exercise and you just forgot about the, the medication, right? Uh, and see how that would work for you. And, and you know, there, there, is, there is something that is it, it's, uh, hard, it's, it's hard to monetize, but it's practically free because all you need is a pair of tennis shoes uh, that solves a lot of things, you know, a lot of medical issues, and that is just a matter of exercise. Just getting out there and getting your body moving. Um, so don't worry, don't get nervous. I've got one of your favorite life verses here this morning. I'm going to read this to you, okay? Uh, is 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. But refuse, but refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Okay? For bodily exercise profiteth little. Everybody says amen. <laughs> but godliness with, uh, is profitable unto all things having the promise of this life that now is and of that which is to come. 
I remember one day I was listening to Rush Limbaugh in my car, and Jack LaLanne had just died. How many know Jack LaLanne? He had juicers, and he had exercises, and uh, Rush was making this argument. Uh, he says, see, this just proves that diet and exercise kills you. <laughs> now, now, Jack LaLanne was in his mid-90s, of course, uh, but diet and exercise killed him. Uh, so what's the Apostle Paul trying to say? He's not saying that exercise is not going to do you any good. He said, but exercise is only going to do you good in this life. But if you exercise yourself unto godliness, it'll be profitable in this life and also in the one to come. Uh, so there's certain practices in this life that we must repeat on a continual basis if we are going to stay healthy with the Lord and with our fellow man, both now and then also in eternity. And we're going to prove from Scripture this morning that forgiveness is one of those exercises. And if you don't exercise forgiveness, that you are going to fail in your walk with God. And then you're also going to fail in your walk with man, both now and it also will affect your eternity. Uh, number one, exercise in the matter of forgiveness is in, the, is in feelings. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. It says, Then he said unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Uh, there's a joke. And you know, we're all, should be in, we're in the Lord's ministry, whether we're in an official, full-time capacity. But once you're saved, you're drafted into God's army, so you are to be in the business of ministering to God's body, uh, to His people, to his church, okay, that you're, you're part of the body, you're part of the bride, uh, that, that you are the household of faith, uh, you are members in particular, and that the Holy Spirit has gifted you with certain gifts, talents, and abilities that you minister uh, to the body with. Now, there's a joke among preachers, okay? Uh, and that is this, is that the ministry is great except for the people. <laughs> I, I know a preacher, R.B. Lett, he said this. His dad always used to say, you know, he was a preacher all his life and a pastor all his life. He says, I feel a calling to the uninhabited fields of the world. <laughs> like he's going to go where the town to a population is zero, and he's going to go start a church there. Uh, but the problem is this in life. Um, it's the old saying, no matter where you go in life, there you are. That's right, I heard about a guy that was shipwrecked on an island. Uh, and when they finally found him years and years later, there was three buildings. He says, what are these three buildings? He says, well, he says, the first one uh, is where I live. And he says, the second one over there is where I go to church. Uh, and he says, well, what's the third building? Well, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> uh, and you know, the problem, you know the problem with the third building is... He was the problem. He was there. Uh, and so the sins of others are not going to be stopped until the Lord Jesus comes back uh, and sin is eradicated and judged for the very last time. Uh, so as long as the God allows, mercifully allows uh, sinners, he's also going to allow sin. And all sin is against God primarily, but then it is also against other people. So we travel this earth together this morning as a congregation of saints, yes, and sinners, uh, and not only do we sin against God, we also sin against each other. Uh, so offenses, Jesus said, will come. They will come. They are guaranteed. Now the first thing he says, he says, woe unto him by whom they come. Uh, so woe in the Bible, anytime you see woe in the Bible, it is the voice of the prophet uh, and he's always proclaiming impending judgment. So we ought to examine ourselves and say, am I an obstacle of offense? Am I a stumbling block to anybody uh, or people that I come across? So there's a warning of woe and there's a warning of offense to make anyone stumble and particularly those stumble in the faith. Um, and then in verse number two, it was better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. Now, one of the little ones has two implications. Uh, one is a little child in the faith. A little child in the faith. Uh, except you have faith as one of these little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of 
heaven and unless you have faith as one of these little ones uh, and if you do you'll be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven uh, so actually a little child and then those who are newborn in the faith and um, you know you bring I'm, you know when you bring home a newborn now Timmy was a year and a half younger than Adriana and somehow um, Adriana was insanely jealous when we first brought Timmy home and <laughs> Timmy's fortunate to be alive you know, she, you know, if you could try, a, you know, a two or three year old, you know, she'd be tried for attempted murder several times. And one of the things you tell the little kids is like, be careful of the newborn's head. has got a soft spot right there in the head and can be quickly injured. So don't, uh, you don't touch a, you know, a little uh, two and a half year old wants to yeah, stick their finger in it or smack them on the back. Of, you know, this is, this is how you greet a little baby when you're two and a half years old and infant. You tap them right on the head like that. Uh, and so, you, you know, you, you guard. Uh, well, it's the same thing with a newborn believer is that they are fragile. Yes, sir. Um, one, of the, one of the best ways I know that you'll pray for me if you bring a visitor to church who's just new in the faith or hasn't grown in the faith, isn't a child in the faith, uh, is um, you'll bring them in. As, you'll be praying the whole time, uh, Lord, help pastor not to say anything that would hurt my visitor, right? Um, <laughs> I remember a friend of mine, Jan, John Palamount, and he, he said to me a Sunday morning, he's, he came into church and he said, um, he said, now listen, he said, my neighbors are coming to church this morning, so don't say anything that will embarrass me. <laughs> um, so that, that type of thing. And then also, you know, you have a newborn believer in the faith, and, and they're new, they're young, and they're just getting their, their feet under, and you want to almost steer them clear of certain Christians. <laughs> Because they would be offended. They're like, what? This is supposed to be a Christian and they're saying this or doing this or whatever. Uh, and so there is a check to be done and saying, man, may we never, and may we also allow for children, people who were struggling. I mean, you know, there should be, you know, on Sunday morning, a few people who just uh, messed up last night and they're, they're dragging themselves in and they're coming in a little bit hungover and they're coming in a little distant. We don't look down our phylacteries at those people. We look at them as children who need exhortation, not as those who needed someone to just kick them and not allow them uh, to grow, that they're new in the faith. So he says, you better be very careful lest you cause somebody to offend. Uh, and we, obviously, we live in society uh, that steers children aside. Uh, we live in um, a society that is secular. And here's what secularism means. It means God out. I saw a little cartoon uh, where there was a dog outside of a schoolhouse. And then there was a voice from heaven. And it was God speaking down to the dog. And he said, he said they won't let me in there. And the dog said, don't feel bad. They won't let me in there either. You know, dogs and God, not allowed. I heard about little Johnny that, uh, you know, he was sitting there. He's, he's talking, uh, talking to his teacher about what he learned at Sunday school uh, yesterday. You know, it was a Monday and a Sunday. They learned about uh, Moses parting the Red Sea. And his teacher informed him, well, actually, Johnny, that was the Reed Sea. And that was just about 10 inches deep. And that's where they crossed at. And uh, little Johnny says, you know what? I just realized something. God is even greater than I thought. That God drowned the whole Egyptian army in ten inches of water. Um, I, I was I was listening I was listening to Jose Rodriguez preach um, on Friday night, and he pastors a couple different churches, and one is a Hispanic church. Got a bunch of Cubans there. He was saying this last Friday uh, that some of his congregants grew up in Cuba, and what they used to do in the public school there is the communists would come in, uh, and of course it was formerly a very religious society there, um, and the communists would get up in front of the class and say, children, um, why don't you pray to Jesus and ask him for ice cream? They'd wait. Uh, and they said, now children, why don't you ask Fidel Castro for ice cream? And guess what the communists would bring with them? Ice cream. Let me ask you, is that any different than in this state? Uh, we have a, a governor. Um, you know, it says in Proverbs 8, all they that hate me love death. Uh, in the most pro-abortion governor, uh, I believe in all 50 states, our governor, he said this. 
God didn't flatten the curve. We did. God didn't give you ice cream. We did. I mean, the same godless culture. And so there is a woe in Scripture for anyone who would cause somebody to stumble in their faith towards God. Uh, how about, um, you know, you know, you know, teaching the Word of God is so wonderful. It's such a blessing. I, you know, I'm so thankful to be called to a pastor. Uh, I get this, you know, blessed, I call it the blessed bondage of being behind the sacred desk. You know, have, having to bring something out of the Word of God each and every week. And so I, I have to have my face in the Word of God. God said, uh, when He saved me, Jack Young is so wicked, I'm going to have to give him a job where he has to study my Word all week long. Uh, and so I do get this wonderful job. But you know, there's a woe unto me. There's a warning. Mm -hmm. Be ye not many teachers, knowing that ye shall come into the greater condemnation. Meaning that if you steer or you make anybody trip up or fall uh, because you're more high profile as a teacher, woe unto you. Uh, and so offenses will come. And it tells us this in Galatians. We're going to turn to Matthew here in a minute. The book of Matthew in a minute. But Galatians 6, 1 and 2. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. So you take heed to yourself. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of God. Um, so he said, if, if a brother is overtaken in some sort of a sin... This means a ditch that they have fallen into, a pit from which they are not getting out of. Okay, and we're going to talk about uh, going and rebuking your brother. This is someone who is stuck in a perpetual sin and a perpetual stumbling block, and you go confront them about their sin. Uh, so he says, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. Okay, so spiritual people should go and help their brother out of sin and help him get on the right Track. One of the reasons why, he says, consider yourself, lest you also stumble. Then he says, bear ye one another's burdens. You know that you're supposed to be a burden bearer? You know as Christ bore your sins, that you, in being Christ-like, are also to help bear the sins of others? So bear ye one another's burdens. They were to be burden bearers and help each other out of uh, trouble. And it says, bear you one of another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. And so in, in your feelings, you know this, that offenses are going to come. And I hear stories all the time. Well, I used to go to church. Then, yeah. X, Y, I, I can fill out all the blanks. For, I can give multiple choice for you. I've, I've heard them all, you know. And, and I want to say, it's too bad Jesus didn't warn us that persecution was going to be coming uh, and that uh, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, too bad uh, that he didn't, you know, didn't say something like, uh, uh, don't be surprised at the fiery trial, which is to try you as if some strange thing cometh. Uh, so you ought to know this and ought to be prepared for this, that the thing that happened to you... <laughs> Jesus said it was going to come. He said offense was going to come. And guess what? He said, well, I can't think of anyone this morning that uh, I have a grudge against or somebody who did something to me. Well, guess what? There is going to be some coming, okay? Uh, and so we ought to know the fact that in the world, offenses are going to come. Now, verse number three talks about those. You have the, the stumbling block. You have the stumbler. Verse number three, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Uh, now Matthew 18, it says, Moreover, if thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. You know what we normally do? Is tell everybody else except for that person. I think of two people, and I, for whatever reason, I was put in the middle of it. Two people outside of this church, people that you don't know. Well, if I name their names, you might. But they're not here. But uh, two different instances here in the past week where, you know, so-and-so did this. And I, and I just reached out to that person and said, hey, do you know that so-and-so? 
had something that you did to them that in both instances it was like immediately you know I, I apologize I am sorry for that I had no business knowing that person should have went to the person that offended them Amen. and talked to that person instead of talking to everybody else Ephesians 4 15 it says speaking the truth in love um, it's a whole lot easier if, I, if Ernie said something to me and I was mad at Ernie and I'm holding that against him, I'm mad at him. It's a whole lot easier for me to assassinate his character to everybody else than just go ahead and go to him and say, Brother Ernie, you said this. You know, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. I was a little offended by that. Uh, it's a whole lot e easier for me in my flesh just to go to everybody else and tell how this guy sinned against me instead of me going to him and then just speaking the truth in love then we see the repentance of the offender and the forgiveness that is available turn if you will to matthew chapter number five here's five different reasons we could find s several other in scripture five different reasons why there should be motivation for us to exercise forgiveness remember this is a spiritual exercise we're to be doing again and again and again hundreds and thousands of repetitions over the course of our lifetime. Um, I want to read you this verse before we look Matthew 5, but I'm going to read you this verse first. This is Mark 11, 25. He says, And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any. You know, we're to be poised with forgiveness. We are to be in a position spiritually where we are we are locked and loaded to forgive the offender. That we've already forgiven them, we're ready to reconcile this person. In the back of our minds, we've already uh, forgiven them of their debt, and we're ready to restore a relationship with this person. So it says, when you stand and pray, forgive. So the posture of praying is forgiveness. Because guess what one of the things that you're going to ask for when you pray is? forgiveness right uh, and so we're in a spirit of forgiveness when we go to the Lord in prayer uh, so here's some reasons for forgiveness uh, number one hatred is murder look at Matthew 21 Matthew 521 521 Matthew 521 And it says there, you have, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall, shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, uh, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. There's an attitude of unforgiveness and hatred. Um, again, when I talk about somebody I'm upset against, I'm going to make sure that they are assassinated in our conversation. That you are going to leave this conversation with a lower opinion of them than when you came into this conversation. And this is an act of murdering somebody's character and murdering them in your heart. Look at verse number 23. Here's another reason. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar. Go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Uh, you are not ready to worship until you've reconciled your brother and forgiven him. Look at uh, verse number 44, Matthew 5. <clears throat> It says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. 
So number three reason is this. You are never more godlike than when you forgive somebody. You know why you forgive? So that you can be like and you can be called the children of your father. Remember that God in heaven <clears throat> is ready and willing to pour his mercy and pour his forgiveness on any sinner that repents. Uh, and so when I'm in the spirit of forgiveness, then um, I am being, it says there, that ye may be the children of your father. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said to his enemies on the cross. Father, what? Forgive, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here's another verse that um, says the same thing here. Ephesians 4, and verse number 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, Amen. even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And here's the number four reason. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse number 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now let me say a word about this. You will not enjoy the forgiveness of God unless you forgive others. So wow, that is, that is pretty tough. That's pretty steep. Here's, here's what's going on in your prayer life. What does God command you to do? Forgive. What is unforgiveness? Unforgiveness is a sin. So I go to the Lord for forgiveness and I am regarding iniquity in my heart. Here's what unforgiveness is. I'm not alleviating you of your debt that you owe me. I'm waiting for my pound of flesh. So I'm carrying that around with me. Um, you know what the... You know what the Bible says in Colossians? Husbands, love your wives and be not what against them? You know what bitterness is? Old unforgiveness. You know what, um, you know what husbands? See some of you out there? You know what? We are, to, we are perpetually exercise in our marriage. Forgiveness. Repetitions of forgiveness day after day after day after day after day. And, you know, I've used this illustration before. I get a husband up here and say, um, she, I don't know, what, what do, I've got a perfect wife, so this is hard for me to come up. <laughs> she, she, she squeezed, I know. She, she's in the nursery, I'd be saying different, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, she squeezed the toothpaste in the middle, you know, and then, Yes, and then, uh, I can't think of anything. But, you know, I mean, we're, we're stacking up week after week, day after day. There's all this unforgiveness. You know what? Eventually, I am not going to be able to carry this debt, this grudge, this bitterness I am carrying against my wife. I'm to release it and release it and release it and release it. And here's what happens in your relationship with God. If you go to God and you have unforgiveness, and um, that is regarding sin, and it's regarding iniquity. Iniquity is just a little bit different than sin. Iniquity is something in you that, that causes you to perpetuate. Sin is that outward missing of the mark, but iniquity is that something that you are regarding inside, and it's continually causing you to sin. Uh, you know, and Proverbs says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You know what? You're, when you're praying, you're saying, God, hear me, but I will not hear you. How can you enjoy fellowship with God uh, if you're telling him to be silent, but you listen to what I say to you? He's saying every time you pray, and we'll get into this exercise here in a minute. Every time you pray, you're saying forgiving our debts. You say, well, I can't forget so therefore I will not forgive well let me tell you something if you don't forgive you ain't never gonna forget but if you forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive every time you remember 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 eventually something miraculous is going to take place is that thing is not gonna have any teeth in you 
it's not even going to enter into your memory bank, but hardly ever. Because you've forgiven it, you've released it, you've released it, you've released it, and you released it. And so that's why the Lord said in his, uh, in really te teaching his disciples to pray. And so each and every day, as we're asking for forgiveness, we're also forgiving others. And I got news for you. Um, I don't care, you know, what your spouse is like. Most likely you're not going to have to forgive them every single day. There's some days you're not going to see them every day or that day, you know. Uh, and, and, and how in the world am I supposed to forgive every single day? Here's the reason why. Because you wake up in the morning and you remember you forgave yesterday, but you remember again today that thing again and you want to pick up that debt against that person. The Lord says every time you pray, you release it, you release it, you release it. You might have to forgive somebody for something they did a thousand times. If you remember it a thousand times, you're going to have to forgive them one thousand times. Uh, and so here the Lord said, if you have a spirit of unforgiveness, it's like, you know, we always used to drive stick shifts up until about five, six years ago. I don't think they make them anymore. They do? Man, I don't know if they make them too much, but uh, we love stick shifts. And you know what's cool is that handbrake right there, you know, the parking brake. And it's amazing in the snow, you know, it's really handy to swing around your back of your car if you need to turn real quick. Uh, but, you know, every once in a while you start driving and you think, what in the world is wrong with this car? It is, it's, it's just not um, moving. It, emergency brakes on. You, you know, there's a lot of believers that wonder what's wrong with their Christian life and their Christian experience and their walk with God. You've got an emergency brake on pulled up in your spiritual walk and it's called unforgiveness. And what you're supposed to do is let that thing go so you can go on in your relationship with the Lord. Um, last place we'll turn in, in Matthew. Um, so hatred's murder. You, you're not ready to worship unless you forgive. Uh, when you forgive, you're the most Christ-like that you are going to be is when you forgive. Uh, and then number four, you'll not enjoy forgiveness unless you uh, you uh, forsake the sin of unforgiveness. Number five is God has forgiven you and that other person of far greater sins. Look at Matthew chapter number 18. So Matthew chapter number 18 and um, look, at, look at verse number 15. And it says, Moreover, if thy, if thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. And then it goes into church discipline here in verse 16 and 17. Um, get two or three witnesses. Tell it before the church. Let him be unto you as a publican and a sinner. So if someone is stuck in that rut and stuck in a sin, that the whole church's responsibility is you know, with publicans and sinners, you know what we try to do is we try to win them to Christ. We don't snub them. We don't thumb our nose at them. That's what the Pharisees did. Uh, but uh, true Christians are going to try to win a publican and a sinner back to Christ. So this is actually a process of restoration. But then the Lord gives a parable and he gives an illustration here about forgiveness. And, you know, Peter said, how, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times. He thought he was doing great because the custom was of that day and age. First off, is that you love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Okay, that, that's what uh, it says in Matthew 5. That was, you've heard it's been said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. So any one of my neighbors, people who had sinned against me, my enemy is those who have sinned against me. Uh, and so Peter says, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times? He thought he was going above and beyond. And what did the Lord say unto him? Seven times what? Seventy. Seventy. Uh, so this is essentially saying infinity. Okay. Uh, he says, so you're supposed to have all the forgiveness that God has. And verse number 23, look at verse 23. Here's a parable. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. When he begun to reckon one and brought unto him that owed 10,000 talents. So he had squandered, what, this wasn't the servant's money, he had squandered the Lord's money. And, and this is the picture of you and I in this life, God has given you your life. 
He's given you your family, your loved ones. He's given you the capacity to work that job and to make that money. He's given you everything that you possess. You are his servant uh, and you're supposed to be a faithful and wise servant of what he's given you. How many of how many have ever squandered any bit of the time, talent, and treasure that God has given you? Okay. Maybe just a little bit. Okay. Uh, and so he's forgiven us of great, great debt. Uh, and so this servant comes and, and begs for his Lord's forgiveness. In verse number 25, it says, But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down, worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me. I will pay thee all. And the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence and laid it on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, besought him, and have patience with me that I may pay thee all. Same prayer, same ask for forgiveness. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. And when the fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. And his Lord, after that, he was called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due to him. So likewise shall thy heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespass. And so, think of this. Um, David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, he was, he was commander-in-chief. We've only had one commander-in-chief that led from the front, and that was George Washington. All the rest sat in the White House and sent 18 to 24-year-olds off to die, you know. Uh, but you know, what King, you know what King David was doing when he was relaxing in the palace? That was unethical. He was supposed to lead his nation to war from the front. And then there was this great man, this great man of renown, Uriah the Hittite, and he was out fighting. He was essentially a private. And of course, David takes, steals his wife. Then there was a great sin committed. She goes back to her house pregnant. Now he calls, um, he calls her husband in from the field. I mean, here's a guy. And, you know, first night, he says, go, go wash your feet. And that was the last thing you would do uh, before you went into bed you know, just wearing sandals. Go down and wash your feet. Well, he slept outside his door. He says, I'm not going to go into my house when my brethren, I mean, he had more, he had more honor than the king himself. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a private in the army. I say, I'm not, I'm not going to go inside my house uh, when my brethren at war. Uh, I'm going to sleep outside my house. Well, David kept him another night. This time he got him drunk. So he, he tried to loosen his morals, mm -hmm. take away his inhibitions uh, to get him to go in his house. He still wouldn't. Still wouldn't go inside his house. Then he sends him away. Then he kills him. And David, for a whole year, uh, regarded this sin in his heart until the preaching of the prophet Nathan comes in, gives him a parable, and he says, Thou art the man. And this is a rebuke to David by God. And here's what David has said. Against thee and against thee only have I sinned and done this great wickedness. You know, all sin is ultimately against God. Anybody who has sinned against you has first and foremost sinned against God. And let me ask you a question. Is God ready to give, forgive that person? Yes. And also, we consider ourselves that God has forgiven you for far more than you ever have to forgive somebody else for. I mean, you had enormous amounts of debt, all of which would justifiably have sent you to hell. But the Lord Jesus Christ took upon himself your debt, which is far more. And he says, now I'm asking you to forgive a little debt. Here's a few thoughts as we close. Turn back to 
Luke 17. Corey Ten Boom, in her letter on how I learned to forgive, said this, Forgiveness is not forgetting the sin committed against us. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will functioning regardless of the temperature of the heart. So here's going to be faith over feelings. Yes, I don't feel like forgiving. We need to say with the disciples, here's what they say when they hear about this forgiveness. Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> okay? Uh, so, you know, I was talking to someone a few weeks ago. They were feeling really depressed and really down, but they're going through the motions. Okay? And so there's some real biological depression out there. Yep. Okay? Uh, and, and they were just going through the motions. And this fellow's working in another church, and he says, you know, I'm, I'm helping out in this other church. And I said, let me, let me tell you something. First off, people have so many problems, they don't even, they, most people are not even going to get a sense that, that you're feeling down, number one. <laughs> and number two, you're, you're having more faith than how you feel. Sometimes you feel like serving the Lord, don't you? Okay? I'm the only one that feels like serving the Lord. Um, well, let me say this. Maybe you can identify with this. Sometimes you don't feel like it. But you do it anyway. And, and faith is, is seeing the invisible. There's going to be an obstacle in front of you. Uh, here the Lord's going to use a sycamine tree. And this is a tree that has a great root system that you can't just reach over there. And you can't pull that thing up. I heard about Robert E. Lee. Uh, he, was one, he, was, he was touring the South. It was down near Atlanta. How many of you ever been down near, near Atlanta? How many of you ever heard of uh, William Te was it Tecumseh Sherman? Is that Sherman? No. Yes, yeah, the burning of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. You know they still hadn't got over that yet? <laughs> they have not gotten over that yet. They call you a Yankee, and it's not a compliment, okay, when you're down there. And they might use an expletive before calling you a Yankee, all right? Uh, and so he was down there in the south, and there was this lady's farm that he, he was going through, and he says, uh, General, I want to show you something. And she went out and showed this, this old tree in the field that there was a war on her field and this tree had been shattered uh, by cannon fire. It was riddled in bullets. And she said, see what these Yankees did. Now to her that was a monument to what the Yankees did to Atlanta. And here's... Here's what uh, Robert E. Lee said to her. He said, ma'am, tear that tree down and forget it. You know what the Lord's going to tell him? He says, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. You know, he says, he, he says in Matthew, he talks about a mountain, okay? Uh, and probably he's point, pointing towards Mount Hermon, great mountain. You can go down the Middle East there. You look at Mount Hermon, there's snow on it. You can go to Mount Hermon, you can go skiing in the Middle East. Great mountain. Uh, so he says, points to this tree, has deep roots that you can't uproot. And you think of Hebrews 12, root of bitterness, springing up. Uh, and so he says, you can say to this tree, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and it will be done accordingly. So Corey Ten Boom, is, he says, besides what your feeling is, he says, you are going to be releasing that debt in your mind. Uh, she gave the illustration of a church tower and the church tower bell. And this dear woman had suffered at the hands of Nazis, being a Dutch girl, hiding, um, hiding Jews from uh, the Nazis there in her town and suffered great things at uh, the hand of the Nazis there in concentration camps. And, and uh, a pastor explained to her, she said, Corey, it's kind of like this bell, this bell tower. He says, I want you to come up here and ring the bell. She pulled it one time. And of course, the, as she let go of the string, that heavy bell, dong, dong, dong. And she said, I want you to notice that as long as you don't grab a hold of that rope and pull it, that bell will stop ringing. What you're going to have to do each and every day is release, 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 forgive, forgive, forgive. And what's going to happen is that bell is going to stop ringing. Amen. Last thing is this. So faith over feelings. 
And then also fidelity over feelings. Look, if you will, there in verse number 7, Luke 17. He says, But which of you, having a servant plowing and feeding, um, plowing or feeding cattle, will say to him, By the way, which he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank his servants, because he did the things which were commanded, I trow not, because I think not. So likewise, ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you. We are in profitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. One thing that is required in service is that a man be found faithful. Here's an illustration of a, of a, a servant, a slave. Time and time again, all the men, you know, men and women of God as they address each other, talked about servants of Christ. Many of the epistles are addressed as Paul, the servant of Christ, or James, the servant of Christ, Jude, the servant of Christ. And what they're actually talking about is not a paid for hire servant, but actually literally a slave to a wonderful master. This is a bond slave relationship. Our master is so good that we voluntarily are his servant. Now, here's the thing. As a servant just does his duty. We're to be instant in season and out of season. So faithfulness. I mean, there's only one thing that God requires of you and that anybody can do it, and that is to be faithful. As I said, your two greatest abilities are availability and dependability. Availability and dependability. I could preach a whole message on that easily. But let's talk about this area of forgiveness. God said, I command you to forgive. That is your duty. And we're to be semper fi, which means always faithful. And you know, God doesn't even have to thank you for it. Guess what? You are going to get rewarded, okay? But you know, um, when the trash man picked up your trash this week, you didn't say, thank you so much for your service today. No, why? Because he worked for you. You had an agreement. And, uh, you know, some of you pay somebody to mow your lawn. They mow your lawn this week. and say, thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. Like, no. You were purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. You were purchased by the forgiveness of God. And you were a servant of God. And you're commanded by your master to forgive. And you know what we're supposed to do? Yes, sir. I'm doing, sir, my duty. Amen. My responsibility is to forgive. Let's stop there and we'll pray. Lord, what a, what a practical, practical lesson. You taught your disciples and you're teaching us, your disciples, this morning. It's not easy, but it is simple. Lord, I pray that you would help us. It, it is impossible that offenses not come. We are going to be offended. We have been in the past and we will be in the future. Lord, help us to do the exercise of forgiveness. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching the sermon today. We'd like to express our thanks to you by sending you this book right here. It's called Done. What most religions do not teach you about the Word of God. It's about how you can have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would email us at mylbbc at gmail.com, we'll be sure to get that out to you. Also, if you'd like to find out more information about us, uh, here in the ministry of the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church, you can find us on the web at lbbc.info. Uh, there at the website, you find out about our ministries. If you'd like to give to this ministry, you can do so there. If you'd like to reach out to us by mail, you can find us at 48 South Estate Drive, Webster, New York, 14580. God bless you. Make sure that you like this video, subscribe, and share. If you do that, we'd appreciate that. God bless.